Who, I said to myself? He's a genius. What the theater needs is a good old-fashioned melodrama. He's a genius. The public is tired of symbolic plays where people He's sit a in a sewer for three acts contemplating their navels. Lou, I said to myself, get yourself a real melodrama with a pretty, innocent young girl and a deep-dyed villain. I tried to get the top playwrights to give me a melodrama. I got stacks of unread manuscripts by unknown writers. Then I found it. The play I was looking for. I entitled it Melodrama. And now Melodrama is the biggest hit on Broadway. The biggest hit of the season. The biggest hit in years. It's making me a million dollars. Lou, I said to myself... You're a genius. Theater 5 presents Melodrama. Thanks for calling, Johnny. No, I haven't found a play yet. Spread the word around that I want a real melodrama. I tell you what, I'm just leaving the office now. I'll meet you at the backstage club in 15 minutes. Hello, Mr. Darren. You're not the type. You're assuming I'm an actress. Who else comes into a producer's office, especially without knocking? Write your name down and don't call us, we'll call you. Well, have I asked you for a job? What else would you want? Uh, plenty. No, Now, look, it'll take a few minutes to explain. It might even take a long time. No, it won't, because I won't listen. I have to leave now. Oh, look, you're looking for melodrama, aren't you? Uh-huh, and I don't expect to get it from any actress. Oh, oh how do I say it? Mr. Darren, I I'm desperate. Oh, I know you're used to having people say they're desperate. I know it isn't a good approach, but look, Mr. Darren, when was the last time an actress came into this office not looking for a job? Young lady, are you trying to pry into my private life? I am deadly serious, Mr. Darren. I, I want a favor, yes, but I'm not looking for a job. Please, please listen to me. What favor? Give me five minutes. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to light this cigarette now, and you have until it's finished to tell me what's on your mind. All right. Oh, my goodness, I better talk fast. I in the first place, I'm not from New York. Actresses never are. I come from a little town upstate. I was the leading lady in the high school dramatic club, and everybody said I was good. Every leading lady in every high school dramatic club is good until she leaves home. I wish you'd stop talking and using up my time. Well, I started acting with a little theater group. A professional critic from Rochester said I was absolutely wonderful as Tina. You know, the girl who sucks her thumb throughout the two acts of Hope is a Crumpled Newspaper Blown by Vagrant Winds. All right. Four months ago, my uncle's estate was settled, and I got $3,500. So you came to New York to play Ophelia. So I came to New York to play anything I could get. <sighs> but it wasn't easy. I tramped around from one producer's office to another, and I never heard a casting director say anything except, you're not the type. Everybody talks about how actresses have aching hearts, and what we really have is aching feet. Two more puffs, and I'll kill this cigarette. Oh, well, here, uh... Have one of mine. <laughs> All right. One more cigarette, just because you're pretty. Fine. And for heaven's sake, Mr. Darren, don't puff so hard. <laughs> what I want to tell you about is something that started one day in the corridor right outside this office. I'd been waiting to see you for three hours, Mr. Darren, and finally I left. Well, a man who had also been waiting caught up with me in the corridor. He was tall and tailored, and he had blue eyes and light hair and a sandy mustache. And, well, naturally, I believed him when he said he was an actor because he had an English accent. I beg your pardon, miss. Oh, yes? I gather we're fellow thespians. I'm looking for a job as an actress, if that's what you mean. I gather that. You may have wondered why I was hanging about so long in Lou Darren's office. I suppose you were looking for a job just like me. Oh, my goodness, no. Lou and I are old friends. Perhaps it isn't modest, but it's a simple statement of fact that I don't have to beg for jobs in the theater. As a matter of fact, I'm Dick Appleton. Oh. Is that so? Yes. And to tell you the truth, I was studying you there in Lou's office. I believe you may be exactly the type I'm looking for. For what? For lunch, to start with. Mr. Appleton, I'm not in the house. Oh, please, I don't want you to misconstrue my motives. Fact is, I'm engaged in a theatrical venture. That's all I can tell you now. But if we have lunch together, we talk together for an hour or so, 
I'll know by the end of that time whether you're the young, fresh talent that I'm looking for. You mean to act on the stage? Exactly. Lunch. Lunch? It was a good lunch. And I found Dick Appleton very easy to talk to. Mostly because what we talked about was me. But by the end of the lunch, I still had no inkling as to whether he was pleased with me or not. Over coffee, though. Well, you are an interesting person, Miss Biddle. What I don't see is how you managed to live here in New York. Well, I do have a little money. Oh? Yes, but it's discouraging when no producer seems to take me seriously. Yes, of course. Uh, I don't suppose you have much money. Mm, my uncle left me $3,500. You know, I, I was wondering whether I ought to go to a dramatic school. Oh, I doubt that you need to. $3,500, you said? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't suppose there's much of that left. Oh, about 2500 Ah, 2500 Then you can sustain yourself during the rehearsal period. Would... Would you say that again? Oh, sorry, my dear girl. Here we are. I've been talking for an hour, and it's obvious to me that you're enormously talented. Golly. You have incandescence. Oh, I've seen that word in drama reviews. I have luminosity. I have? Indeed, you certainly have. Now, let's get down to business. I'm associated in the production of a new play by... Well, I'm not at liberty to say who the playwright is yet. Oh, of course. But he is one of our rarely fine modern playwrights. The play is symbolic. It's all about a girl surrounded with abnormal uncles and aunts, cousins and brothers and sisters, you know, who runs away to find sanity by living in a sandbox. Oh, oh, the sandbox is symbolic. I knew you had a quick mind. And the writing itself, stark, almost incoherent. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Oh, it is. I'm sure it'll run two years. Now, then, I want you to play the girl. The lead? The lead. But I don't want to unveil you to my associates until I've coached you for some time. Oh, I'll do anything you say. Splendid. Now, I have a small apartment here in the city. I live in Bucks County, actually. Now, if you'd come to that apartment each day... Starting when? Starting now. Let's go. For two weeks, I rehearsed in that apartment. Mr. Darren, you have no idea how exciting and demanding he was. Why, sometimes he'd have me read one line over and over again, different ways for an hour. Oh, he seemed to know an awful lot about acting. Wait a minute. My cigarette's out. I, I know. I noticed. But I hope you're going to listen to the rest of it. I am, yes, and I'll tell you why. This man said he was a good friend of mine. Yes? I don't know anybody named Dick Appleton. I'm not surprised. He acted as if he were well-known in the theater. I can say with authority that there's no Dick Appleton in the theater. I'm not surprised at that either. Who was this guy? Will I go on? Yes. Well, as I say, he rehearsed me hard for two weeks. He criticized my walk, corrected my diction, told me that all my life I had been sitting down and standing up without really knowing how to do these things. Well, then one day when I arrived at the apartment... Oh... Hello, Mary. Good morning. Uh, come in, won't you? Right. Well, shall we start? Uh, ready, Mary, I don't know. What's the matter? I just don't know how to tell you this. Oh, dear, something's terribly wrong. It certainly is. Here, I've made you put in your time here for two weeks. Really, I feel I ought to pay you for it. I don't understand. You know what an angel is, of course. Oh, sure, the backer of a play, the man who puts up the money. Well, that's one way of saying it. My way of saying it this morning is that an angel is a devil. Well, I, I think you'd better explain. Uh, sit down, won't you? All right. Well, naturally, I have a backer for this play we've been rehearsing. I've put in a good deal of my own money, but I did need the backer's money, too. Now, the playwright trusts me implicitly. And when I told him about you, he said he'd take my word for your talent. The backer. I see. The backer doesn't want me? The backer insists on a big-name star. Oh, dear. Either I agree to cast a star, in which case you don't get the part, or I insist on you, in which case the play doesn't go on. There isn't any other way of getting the money? Not quickly enough, no. Oh, wait a minute. If I sold my telephone company, should... Oh, no. 
that it'd almost make it, but we'd still need another $2,000. Oh. $2,000. But I have $2,000. Oh, no, 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 Mary. I couldn't take the Look, money. Look, there isn't anything wrong with an actress investing in a play, is there? Well, no, it's done all the time, of course, especially when the actress is going to star. In the play. Well, then. No, oh, Mary, I hate to do But don't you see? You're doing me a favor. Well. Look, when do you need the money? Well, as a matter of fact, yeah, right away. I have to put a deposit down right, for the right, theater. Right. Now, you stay right there. I'm going to go down to the bank, and I'll be back in 15 minutes with $2,000. <laughs> I ran all the way to the bank, and then all the way back. And when I gave Dick Appleton the $2,000, it was wonderful to see how happy he was. Oh, wonderful, Mary. Let me kiss you. Mm. No rehearsing today, Mary. Go on home, take a nap, and dream about opening night. He didn't have to tell me to dream about opening night. I did nothing else from then until the next morning when I returned to his apartment. I knew, or at any rate I thought, that yesterday he had put down the deposit on the theater. Oh, I was so excited. I was an actress. I was going to be a star. Well, when he didn't answer my knock, I tried the door. It opened. So I, I walked in. The apartment was vacant. All the furniture was gone. Dick Appleton was gone. And my money was gone. Well, Miss Biddle, that's a very interesting story, but I don't see what it has to do with me. Mr. Darren, the story is not finished yet. You said you were going to ask me a favor. That's right. What is it? Well, you'll have to hear the whole story first. I'm overdue at the backstage club. You haven't been interested in what I've been telling you? I've been very much interested. But when somebody wants a favor and tells me a long story, finally ending with the information that her money is gone, I get suspicious. Aha, uh -huh. you're afraid I'm going to ask you for money. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Well, I won't keep you in suspense about that. I am going to ask you for money. Time for me to leave for the back. No, 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 the rest of the story doesn't take long. And I can assure you that you're going to want to give me money when I'm finished. This is some kind of blackmail. No. Oh, well. I'll admit, you've got me interested. Go ahead. Well, I was left with less than $500. And you can't live long on that amount in New York. Of course, I tried to locate Richard Appleton. But the police told me there was no such person in Equity or the League of New York Theaters or in the Bucks County telephone book. I don't suppose Appleton was his real name anyway. He was gone with my money, and I didn't think I'd ever see him again. Then, just this morning, I went into a cafeteria on 23rd Street, and there he was, sitting alone at a table, having breakfast. He didn't see me until I'd taken a seat opposite him. Excuse me, here, let me get that tray out of your way, miss. Oh. Oh. How do you do, Dick? I beg your pardon? I'd like my money back. I'm afraid there must be some mistake. We can start with the fact that you called me, uh... Dick, wasn't it? Actually, my name is, uh, Mortimer. Mm-hmm. I don't imagine your name is Mortimer any more than it is Dick, and I don't care what your name is. I want my money. Say, miss, are you quite sure you're all right? Perhaps I should call a doctor, or... Uh, perhaps I should call a policeman. Really, I don't know what this is all about, but by all means, let's untangle it, shall we? If you're looking for a policeman, there's one over there. Oh, where? Right behind you. Oh, well, then... I... He had tricked me. There wasn't any policeman there. He was just getting me to turn around. And now, there he was, running away from me, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. But you know what New York is like. As soon as I screamed, stop, thief, everybody in that cafeteria hunched over their coffee and pretended not to hear me. So I had to chase Dick Appleton myself. Well, he knew I was after him. He ran down the street, turned the corner, but he never got very far ahead of me. I didn't waste my breath. I knew no one would help me. He turned another corner, and when I reached it, I was just in time to see him running up the steps of a brownstone house. And I pounded up the stairs after him. 
The nameplates on the doorbell revealed only one with the initials R.A. Roger Amster and 2B. I took a chance and I went to 2B. Yes, who is it? Exterminator. Oh, good. Oh. I, uh, think I'm in better condition than you are, Mr. Appleton. Hamster, hamster, or whatever it is, I... If you want to start running again, I, I can chase you all over town, but sooner or later you'll have to give me my money. Well, I guess the jig is up, eh? Why don't you come in? No, thank you. Look, if the money is in this room, please go get it and bring it here to the door. If you have to go out to the bank for it, I shall go with you. And if I've spent it? If you've spent it, you'll go with me to the police. Look, Betty, you may be able to outrun me. But really, I am taller and stronger than you are. Ow! Now, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to walk right past you and out of here. I think not. Now, listen, you let me go. To the police. Do I look like an idiot? I- I'm leaving. Are you real? Oh, yes, I... Oh, you... You wouldn't. Rather a pretty little knife, isn't it? Oh, no. no. Very sharp, too. Quite valuable. Not merely because it has a jeweled handle. Oh, you wouldn't dare use that knife. I'm afraid that's only your opinion. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Oh, no. No! Stop it! No! Stop it! Oh, oh my God! You try to tell me you killed him? Yes, Mr. Darren. When was this? I told you. This morning. This morning? Wait a minute. How do you know he's dead? Well, I, I, uh, I, I didn't leave right away. I, uh, examined him. Do you want me to go into detail? No. Look, if he'd been alive, I would have called an ambulance. What have you been doing since this morning? I've been, I've been... Walking around the city trying to think what I should do. And anyway, around two o'clock this afternoon, I, I called the police and I told them a man had been murdered and where they could find the body. You didn't tell them who you were? No, not then, but but I'm going to. Uh, when I leave here, I'm, I'm going right to the police station. I've never heard of anything like this. I'm sure you haven't. But why did you come here? What have I got to do with you or, or with that Appleton or whatever his name is? I told you I had a favor to ask of you. You told me more than that. You said you were going to ask for money and that I'd give it to you. Well, I won't. Won't? Not even when it means hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket for a relatively small investment? What are you talking about? Mr. Darren, you've been looking for a melodrama. And I need money for my defense. Now, haven't I given you a good plot for a melodrama? And isn't that worth the money to you that my lawyer will ask? Uh, well, well, you're going too fast for me. Look, I don't claim I've told you the whole play. But what happened today brings us up to a good first act ending. Mr. Darren, at the end of the first act, the girl comes to the producer and asks for money, just as I've asked money from you, for the defense. Hmm. It's not a bad first act. All right. Now, suppose the producer helps her. Suppose you shielded me, hid me, while the police were looking for me, while you were looking for proof that I did it in self-defense. I think you've got something. Listen, there's a playwright I know, and if I can get him on the phone, he'll be over here in half an hour, and you tell him everything you've told uh, that, me. That uh, won't be necessary, Mr. Darren. Huh? Mr. Darren, you have been trying to get every big playwright in town to write you a melodrama, is that right? Yeah? But you ought to know that nowadays, big-name playwrights are interested only in one thing. In those plays about girls who suck their thumbs or sit in sandboxes. Mr. Darren, would you please tell me why you never read your unsolicited manuscripts from unknown playwrights? What are you talking about? Uh, just a minute. Is that your pile of unsolicited scripts? Excuse me a minute. All right, now let's see. Ah. Here it is. Now, here is a play you've had in your office for exactly four months, Mr. Darren. You've apparently never read it, but you know something? Just now, you found the first act awfully interesting. 
Melodrama, a play in three acts. By Mary Biddle, that's me. It'll make you a million dollars, Mr. Darren. It'll make you a genius. Theater 5 has presented Melodrama, written by Robert Senadella and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, George Petrie, and Lon Clark. Audio engineer Bill Sandreuter, sound technician Ed Blaney. Story editor Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and will appreciate your comments. Please write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production.